elementary music teacher friend, you love what you do, but you might feel unappreciated and in fact, unseen some days. You may even feel like you're on a music teacher island and just want to connect with other music teachers who can relate to both your struggles and wins when it comes to teaching elementary music. I get you and understand completely the feelings you're having. That's why each and every week, the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast will provide you with solo and guest episodes that will help you realize you're not alone in your music teaching journey. Throughout each episode, my goal is for you to be able to walk away with actionable steps and ideas to help you feel like you're ready to take on the new week with whatever challenges may be thrown your way. Hi, I'm your host, Jessica Peresta, and I'm so glad you're here. Whether you're at home, in your car, in the shower, or wherever else you're listening, grab your cup of coffee or whatever other beverage is nearby and listen in to the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. As an elementary music teacher, maybe you're tired of feeling overwhelmed in your teaching and home life. Harmony membership is exactly where you need to be. There are many times you need support, but you don't have a music teacher mentor or you're the only elementary music teacher at your school. You have questions, but you don't want to bother anyone else because you know that they're busy. The overwhelm sets in and you begin to feel stuck. That's exactly why the Harmony community was designed. I created Harmony because of the frustrations I faced as an elementary music teacher. I had no mentor, no resources, no community, and basically had to figure it all out on my own. It's my mission to make sure other music educators don't feel isolated or struggle in your elementary music teaching journey. By becoming a mentor, you are going to get all open office hours to come and ask me any questions, accountability week every week where you can connect with an accountability group, get a mentor or be a mentor, you get lesson plan packs, entire lesson plans done for the entire school year for K to fifth grade that are editable, that have resources that you can also use to plan with and to use with your students. And there are also ways to modify the lesson plans for virtual and on a cart teaching. You also get monthly lesson planning sessions where you get to come together with other members to plan out your lessons for the next month. And you get accountability calls where you get to come and talk about any of your struggles and wins you're facing with other members that are there to give you support. You get mindset sessions with me where I'm going to talk about anything you might be facing in your work or home life. And those lesson plan packs I mentioned earlier also have a section in each and every one of them that talk about classroom management and mindset struggles that pertain to that particular month of the school year. When you join, you're going to see a start here section that guides you exactly what to do so you don't feel overwhelmed as this membership site is entering its fourth school year. Then you're going to see something called a success path. You identify where you're at and follow the action steps that will take you from feeling overwhelmed to confident. The different stages of the success path include learning, which is where you're going to focus on coping with stress. Stage two is growing, helps you with classroom management and transitions in the music room. Stage three is planning and is going to help you with simplifying lesson planning and program planning. And stage four is implementing, which is all about what do you do now and it helps you with continuing to move forward as a music teacher and also to implement technology into your lesson plans. There's so much more that you can learn inside the membership site that's going to help you move forward. Like I said, it's going into its fourth school year. So there is a whole section that's called teaching topics where you get to pick different topics based on what you need. And it will take you to different videos that have minute markers or guides or sections inside the membership to help you move forward so you don't feel stuck. So if you're ready to join us, go ahead and click on that link in the show notes and you can go ahead and go to the page to read all about Harmony or just simply head to harmonymembership.teachable.com forward slash P forward slash Harmony Hub and you will be able to enroll and join us. I hope to see you in there and I cannot wait to get started. 
I'm Alfonso Mendoza, host of the My Ed Tech Life podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome back to the podcast. I am joined today by Chandler Owen, and we are going to talk about bridging the gap between students with and without private music lessons. And before Chandler introduces himself, we got to meet each other at the Arkansas State Music Ed Association Conference. That's a lot to say, but we just kind of started having some conversations, and I'm really excited about this topic. And even before we started recording, we were kind of both talking about our experiences with private lessons, whether it's teaching or taking them. And I told him I have never had this conversation on the podcast, so I'm super excited. But anyways, before we dive in all that, Chandler, would you introduce yourself to the listeners today? Yes. So I actually am just a lowly intern right now. I am student teaching at Clarksville School District in Clarksville, Arkansas. And along with that, there's some other things that I've done throughout my education in Arkansas Tech. I'm graduating this December finally. Yay. Yay. Um, but I have taught private music lessons for quite a while. I don't know how many years I've taught, but mm -hmm. I have taught specifically at River Valley Music Center here in Russellville for two years now. And for the past year or so, I have been on the uh, leadership administration team. And since July, I have been considered the superintendent. And now I have been pushed into the role of COO. So I'm just the operations officer. I just do everything for the daily operations. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I just now this uh, past month started a nonprofit foundation to give music major scholarships. Hopefully we can get all that started up within the next year. But that's that's all I've got my hands in right now. Yeah, that's so cool. You and I were talking at the conference about that, and I knew it was coming out soon. And I believe I saw you announce it on LinkedIn the other day. And I was like, no way. Yay. I'm so yes. glad that that's finally like come out into the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, we, like I said, are going to talk all things private lessons. And so let's start off by talking about bridging the gap between students with and with out private music lessons. So I would just love to start off by hearing about why this is something that's so near and dear to your heart. So teaching private music lessons before entering the full scale 30 student classroom or just regular music classroom, I think it's giving me this very odd view of what I see in the schools. I teach piano and voice. So those two are going to be the ones where, oh, those students, um, no matter how young they are, are going to eventually be interested in band or choir. And I found that there was a five-year-old student I had recently. She had to quit lessons because of uh, time conflict. But during her time with me, she would just talk about all the things she's doing in music. And I found that she was going so far ahead of what her classmates were in their learning process of music. And I started to understand it from the teacher's perspective and understand how frustrating that can be for the classroom teacher is, oh, this student's shining mm -hmm. and you don't want that student to outshine everybody else. And to bring it back kind of towards more where I am in the 712 category, I have a high school student right now. She's a piano student, but she wanted to work on her all region music for choir. And she's really great at piano, but I, ne I never even knew she was in choir. And then all of a sudden I learn, oh, well, she's in the top ensemble at her school. And then not only that, I believe she made eighth chair all region, oh my which is not a bad thing. She's mm -hmm. she's a wonderful, talented student, but I can see where the the students in private music lessons get so much more. And of course, that's probably that's just how it's going to be. But I can see how frustrating it might be from the classroom educator standpoint instead of a private um, standpoint that the students are outshining the others and it can become a negative thing, especially mm -hmm. the younger ones. And like that student that I mentioned a bit ago, the younger one, she performed at uh, in front of her whole school because I believe she went to a private school, but mm -hmm. she she performed in front of them and it was a great thing. But thinking back to when I was in school, for example, let's use my AP physics class. The students would get upset when I made 
uh, the top score because I'm the one who set the curve. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> that that's kind of essentially what's happening here with these students that are in private lessons and the students who are not. And it can eventually become a negative thing for these students and some of their self-esteems because they see that this this student's getting all this attention and, hey, that's great. And I don't think, especially on the elementary level, they realize I can shine at something else. Mm -hmm. So we want the whole class to shine when we teach a lesson, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's so easy to, when you were talking, I was thinking about the fact that I am guilty of this. I'll just be honest. Of When you ask the class a question in elementary music, whatever grade level it might be, I kind of know I have like my go-to students without singling them out, but you know the ones who are going to know the answers because you're right. I have kind of not just like I knew who took private lessons just so I could ask them a question, but I figured out real quick who already had kind of a background knowledge of music and they already just kind of know, already know that that's the musical stuff. Oh, I know the lines and spaces. Like that's what we're kind of talking about right now in third grade. But I have to be also better about giving those students a chance to answer as well, who are on grade level, but they're just not, like you said, they haven't taken a private lesson. And so I was talking to you about this before we started recording about my experience of being in private lessons, but then also being in school. And the fact that I fell way ahead of other students, but didn't really ever equate it to the fact that I had private music lessons. But I remember, you know, it's one of those things, whatever the subject area is, and the teacher will ask a question. And if you're looking around the room, like, am I the only one that knows this? And I would sometimes sit back and pretend I didn't know the answer because I wanted to I don't know. I got tired of being the one to answer all the questions. And so right. I see I see a lot of what you're saying. I totally get it. And, and I feel like some of this is kind of looked over in music because it's not something in the forefront of our minds. But some of us as educators, especially in the new ones, are going into this and not really seeing the true potential of what a music classroom could be sometimes. Even me and my host teacher at Clarksville were talking today. I saw this video that I was looking on Instagram during lunch. It was this video. There was this restaurant of people and it was in France. And somebody just started playing da, 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 mm -hmm. da, da. Yeah, obviously, <laughs> us as music educators know where that's from. Yeah, I mean, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. start singing in the restaurant and then we get to the chorus and the whole restaurant joins in. That could be the culture here in our area. Like... That's what our music classrooms in America could, could potentially lead to. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like parents aren't as invested in music as others. And then that's where the gap is. Yeah. Yeah. So you've already touched on, you just said the word gap. You've already touched on a lot of that about what gaps you notice with the students who are in private lessons versus those who aren't. Are there any of those gaps that maybe you haven't mentioned that you want to talk about? There is especially one big gap. There are those students who have the parent and themselves are interested, but can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So this actually happened with me. A student was in lessons and then it, you know, eventually was something they could no longer afford. And, you know, me as a college student, I could not devote the time to help that student without the paycheck. That's the sad truth about that. And I was trying to figure out ways that I could give. And this is something that I've thought about with my foundation too. How can I give you a scholarship at this point? Like I want you to be in mm -hmm. lessons, but there's those gaps of we don't have the money for the private right. ed education. Yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah, I have researched that before too and thought about it because you're right. There is, I've taught in low income areas and a lot of the students who wanted private lessons, but like, you're exactly right, their families couldn't afford it. And so it may be where there's, like you said, scholarships available, or I know I have also seen several, um, and maybe it's like virtual jobs, but even in Arkansas, I've seen jobs posted where it's a volunteer lesson teacher. And so I think maybe even some of the boys and girls clubs or places like that will offer private lessons. And there's people that will volunteer. So I know it is available, but it's getting it, I don't know, out there more or affording opportunities for students to take lessons. That is something that is near dear to my heart as well. 
And it's it's so hard to see this discrepancy of these parents can afford to put their kids in lessons and these can't. And it's like, how do we? Yeah, I'm also with you. Like, how do we bridge that gap? Because that is a big gap. You're right. It's something that is very noticeable and obvious and it's there. And so, yeah, you're right. So when you feel like families want to put their children in private lessons but can't afford it, we've already talked about you know, your foundation you're wanting to start and things like that. But, you know, even where you work, do you guys have some scholarships set aside? Or what are ways that we could, I don't know, are there other ideas you have for helping students get into private lessons? It's really a tough spot, especially right now. One of the big issues in Arkansas, you know, there's the the Learns Act that changed some things about Mm -hmm. funding and lots of stuff. That doesn't necessarily correlate with this, but it kind of does still affect it. Right now, although the base pay for teachers has gone up, one thing that I've discussed with my host teachers is what are your views of teachers who are full-time teachers that provide private lessons? Mm -hmm. And generally what I've gotten is, hey, if it's your student, you don't have a right to charge them. That's not ethical. And I, I agree with that. But teachers don't want to have to set aside their time for something like that. It, it's it's not really fair to them either. Right. And I also have to think about specifically where I work without giving too much information. Yeah. We're struggling to keep our tuition as low as it is because inflation, everything, my boss has to, you know, pay everybody. Mm-hmm. So with that being mm-hmm. said, we don't currently offer a scholarship because where would that money come from? We do have a retail side, but how do we keep that open without hiring a store employee? It all comes down to the time it takes to spend. And as passionate as I am about it, I want to spend the time on these kids, but I can't spend the time on these kids if I'm not going to make rent kind of thing. Yeah. And although it's not as bad as a situation as that for somebody who has a full-time job, because, you know, I'm I'm in college. I'm obviously not making that much there. I'm not spending too much time. I'm in my internship. But us as teachers, you know, how can we get together to help this? In the situation, I'm kind of giving you an issue that I don't have the answer to. Yeah. Except for there's one thing that I have saw in the past year with some of my friends who have graduated, specifically in Missouri. One of my peers had gone and gotten a job. I believe it was a K-12 job in Missouri. And the expectation there was to actually teach these students piano and guitar skills. And I know a lot of times we like to use ukulele and recorder. Yeah. But one thing I'm wondering is what if we had something to where we can start teaching some of these elementary kids some more piano skills? Because I remember my grandma always talked about she had this printout copy of a little keyboard. So where she went home and she had to practice without hearing it. Oh, yeah. And they, but... And back in her day of Mm -hmm. about elementary, all learned piano. Because at that point, maybe some of those private lesson students could help you teach. They could be like, hey, or we could workshop some of those things. So kind of what I'm getting at is I'm not so sure that the problem is getting students in private lessons, specifically private lessons. Mm -hmm. Another option, for example, would be I at River Valley Music Center could start offering a class piano course. Yeah. And make it cheaper for the students as a whole. Yeah, so there's some of those ideas of how we can bridge this gap is mm-hmm. we can work with some of the community's private lesson teachers to see if we can bring that price down for class style private lessons, mm-hmm. which is kind of weird to say now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. And, I know <laughs> and one thing I've started using with my junior high students in the choral ensemble, there's one class where some of the students have gone above and beyond and I just, luckily, one of their parents works at the school district. So I was able to kind of workshop this and be like, what can I do? Because we're always taught in our education classes, for those that are going above and beyond, we need to provide extra opportunities to challenge them. Mm -hmm. We can begin to do that with them, but in a way that could possibly also work with the others. I'm like, hey, why don't you come to the front of the class and you help me lead rehearsal for this one time? And obviously don't choose the same student, but you come, will you sing the soprano one part right in front of them? You know, like I would with my host teachers, if we're all in there, um, we're all helping out parts. Let them become a part of the teaching process. Yes, I love that. Um, I was nodding because I literally just listened to my friend Jessica Grant, her podcast. It's called High Afternoon Tea. No, she renamed it to music learning with Jessica Grant or something like that. But she just talked about that, 
having her middle school students be the teacher and like lead lessons. And so I was, I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Cause I just heard that. I had two thoughts as we were talking. One is I have two middle school sons and their school does clubs. They just started these where at certain times throughout the day, I don't think they do it every day, but maybe once a week, even they have different clubs you can sign up for at a certain time of the day. And I thought, I don't even think, I mean, they have band and choir, of course, you know, and orchestra, but how cool would it be if they had a music club where like it is piano and maybe, I don't know if there's a way, even a music store, even they just bring it and set it up just for that hour and then take it back or something like that. There might be a way to do that. But it got my brain turning too. We're like, we could totally do that for elementary music as well. But all that to say, I also remember a situation where I had a friend of mine who she would teach piano to this mom's children. And then in return, the mom would help her with babysitting and they would kind of trade that way. So sometimes there's like a trade or barter type of situation too, where if it is a financial reason, there are ways to kind of work it out in that way as well. But I don't know, when you're talking about schools, I just think like, man, like a club or like they have after school clubs for all kinds of things. So like, why not like a piano club if it's you know like that would be so cool. So I'm now one thing I do want to mention is I know there's try in. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't really looked too much into it because, you know, still in my intern face. But, you know, oh, yeah. there is one thing I don't know if people know about yet, but I know it's not the elementary side, but it's getting kind of in there because it's junior high but Mm -hmm. beta has started doing another competition that is a music competition i don't know what it involves so we're seeing kind of some of those things being maybe brought back to the table um but like i said uh, from my perspective i was seeing it more in the older ages and that doesn't really fix the problem right because by that time they're already at so many different levels Mm -hmm. when we were talking about bridging the gap towards the beginning of this conversation we were also talking about the gap you see in in school between students who have private lessons and those who don't where they have a little bit more musical knowledge and theory under their belt than students who haven't been in a private lesson setting so when we're talking about in a school setting those students who feel like they're further ahead of their peers Or in return, the students who feel like they are not catching on as quick. How do you kind of bridge that gap in the classroom where you have, I mean, this goes for anything, but even as your student teaching, you're seeing this, you have students across the board with different learning styles and some learn faster, some need a little bit more time. And so do you have any thoughts around that, how to bridge that kind of gap? I actually can draw from my internship right now. I am, my host teacher does have one general music class for sixth and seventh grade, and it's the alternative learning environment class. So with that, what I've seen is I've seen it just recently. We were talking about popular music, and I know this is like probably very like low level thinking on this, but some of them were talking about, oh, I know this person, this person. And then there was like a couple of students who had no idea who they're talking about. Then it also become a problem where half the class knew what we were referring to when we were saying popular music and then half the class Mm -hmm. not. And it became like a, you know, kind of actual issue where they, we kind of lost classroom management for a bit because we were, (laughs) they were talking about, well, this is what it, and they were trying to find each other. I think what one thing that we did to successfully, you know, bring it all down and bring it back was, Hey, come back. And then we had the, the one who was, so fired up and ready to tell everything they knew. I was like, <laughs> okay, go ahead and have the floor for a second. Give them that opportunity to shine. Right. But then not right away, but like give it a second and then have the student who didn't understand have something in your brain kind of going and ready to go. Here's your moment to shine. So that that bridges mm-hmm. the social gap. Of, hey, this student just shined in what we're talking about. Okay, now this one needs to. And that can successfully keep them in a positive mindset of music instead of that one thing I was touching on at the beginning of, hey, this one's shining. And then they start to see music as a negative thing. And then they they don't have an opportunity to shine whatsoever. Yeah, And you can do yeah. that with like, like, you know, the whole, if you're doing quarter notes, half notes and everything, if somebody's just not getting it and those students will get fired up if they're getting it <laughs> and somebody's not, they're like, no, it's this. If you can ensure that you'll have a way for that student who's not getting it to shine, go ahead and let the other one shine and bring it all together. And 
make it kind of like a family community kind of vibe of, hey, we're all teaching you that. We're all learning together. Mm -hmm. Because it also doesn't have to be you as the teacher just being, hey, this is what it is. You're exactly right. And I love to encourage my students that everybody has something to share. Even if you don't get the right answer, even if you don't exactly know, we still want to hear your opinion and want to hear you share because we think your voice is valuable. And so I love that you said that because um, I also tell my students that some students may, you know, when you were talking about half notes, quarter notes, things like that, maybe that's something that, that comes really easily to them. Just like a math class, there's certain math skills that comes easily to some kids and others. It takes them a little bit longer to get there versus over here, you have this different area of math. Well, same with music. Some are going to pick up on things like that quicker versus others who are going to pick up on other skills quicker. And so it's always a push pull. And I think just encouraging students that the more they're in there and exposed to music and given the opportunity to have a voice, like you said, they're going to feel more comfortable and confident sharing. And I always tell my students, it's a team sport in here. And then they, I, of course, it, music's not a sport. Well, it is in here because we're all on a team. And so we all encourage each other and listen to each other's voices. And I think that's a great way to encourage those students that you're going to be learning and you're going to get it and it's okay. We're not all on the same playing field and that's okay. Yeah. So whether a student has been taking piano lessons from the age of five or maybe has their first exposure to music history in a music classroom setting or music theory, I guess music history too, but they can still achieve greatness. And I know, of course, you agree with this, but it can take a little bit longer for someone to grasp concepts, but they're all musically great, right? I mean, in one way or another. Yeah. 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 One thing I do want to touch on them is brain, brain drawing back to my private lesson because that's my life right now, I guess. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, there was one 12 year old student who I had for two months, I do believe. And it was very hard from, you know, my standpoint to really, really encourage this student because there were some things that the student was just not getting. And you know, when it's those things that you cannot move forward until they get it and you don't want to beat the dead horse. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and this being in a private setting, you know, I know this student is currently in that's fifth grade. So, yes, currently in a general music classroom. And I know the general music teacher that this student had, like I knew what education the student was getting. And I, I'm seeing where some of the things may have been definitely wasn't missed in the student's education. I would bring something up and the student would be, oh, yeah, I remember that when Miss So-and-so said this. I was like, OK, what does that mean um, on this specific topic? It was more or less around the idea of how long the length of value of, of yeah. notes. And that tied in with I'm trying to teach this student not only that, the idea of pitches, because we're learning piano. Mm -hmm. There were some things that just weren't clicking. And with this student, I could see maybe what happened was either some of the class was farther ahead and they moved on without this student. That's actually possibly most likely what happened. Um, and you really kind of, for some of those things, need the full class to help this student. Right. Because it takes a community to raise somebody. It takes mm -hmm. their peers themselves. Like, we raise each other. Nobody really likes to say that. But like, let's be honest, it, it's actually funny um, because it happened today. <laughs> uh, there was there was actually a fight in my classroom oh, over something silly. Yeah. Over something, it was the boys choir over something silly. But the other guys in the room, because obviously those guys were removed, but the other guys in the room learned something from it. And I'm glad that the experience happened because it provided a learning opportunity and we moved on with the lesson and got things done. In the case of this student in the private lessons, something was missed because everybody moved on without. That makes total sense. Yeah, it's yeah, like you said, the community, it's community in the music room and just being able to see where your students are, not just moving at the pace of your fastest student, but seeing where all students are and who needs the most help and are they getting it? And I get asked this question a lot about how do you assess your students? And there's a ton of advice around that, but my biggest piece of advice around that is literally to read the room is to see the eyeballs that are looking at you you can see the kids looking at you and they're they're either like looking at you like a deer in the headlight like what is she talking about or you kind of see the glimmer in their eyes of i get this i totally understand her Ooh, and their hand shoots up 
But start looking at the students who maybe never have that aha moment and aren't raising their hand and are just kind of, you see maybe 90% of the kids and there's always that 10%, maybe even one or two kids who just kind of were flying under the radar and they could just be quiet. Let's just be honest. It could be a shyer kid, but sometimes it could be because they're not getting it. And so I love that you said that, like, we can't just move on just because like the majority of them are getting it. We need to make sure those other kiddos are grasping things as well. And that they feel confident in the music room and are learning to the best of their ability as well. And so, yeah, you're exactly right. Uh, so before we go, where can everybody connect with you after this episode? So you can connect with me through the River Valley Music Center page on Facebook. We also have an Instagram. I am currently not aware of what the Instagram is, but you can always find it through Facebook <laughs> now that met us together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but also the new Chandler Owen Music Foundation Facebook page is up and it's com.foundation on Instagram. Of course, you can find me on Facebook, but I don't really post anything on there. But those are my two organization pages. And yeah, I think that's all. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming on the episode. I really enjoyed talking with you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was fun. Well, hey there. Thank you so much for listening into the Elementary Music Teacher Podcast. There is an exclusive Facebook group just for listeners of this podcast and any elementary music teacher called the Elementary Music Teacher Community Facebook group. Come on over and join us there where we have conversations around the podcast episodes and encourage each other each and every week. And also head to my website, thedomesticmusician.com. I have some free resources there that you can download to help you gain traction in your classroom today as well as the blog and the membership site and all kinds of other goodies to help you keep going in your music teaching journey. I cannot wait to keep connecting with you and encouraging you and spurring you on in your journey of teaching elementary music. Hang in there, have an amazing week, and I will see you soon.